Hola, Argentina. I am really excited to be here with you today, albeit virtually. Uh, as you might be able to tell, I was overdue a haircut back in March, and then the world shut down, so I haven't been able to get one. But the uh, one benefit of us all being stuck at home is that at least I can get to join conferences like this one. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about lessons I've learned about software development over the past 20 years, and how I've been applying those ideas to my most recent project, which is called Dataset. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to mention the q and I've set up a Google Doc for questions and answers. Um, the link to that document is here at the bottom of the screen, this bit.ly link. And please, while I'm talking, feel free to add questions in English or in Espanol to this document. And I will answer those during the live stream as, as best as I can. So I'm going to start by showing you something fun that I've built with my project dataset. This is my dog, Cleo, and Cleo has a Twitter account. And she tweets all sorts of bits and pieces, including any time she goes to the vet, she tweets a selfie of herself, um, and she says how much she weighs. She uses the scales there. So Dataset is software for pulling data into a relational database and letting you um, interact with it. So I've got a Dataset table right here, which is all of Cleo's tweets. This is everything that she's ever tweeted. And because it's in a SQL database, I can run queries. So I'm going to search for I weigh and filter down to just those queries where she's talked about her weight. But I can go a step further and construct a full SQL query. This is a query I wrote, which uses a regular expression to pull out her weight in pounds and turn that into a column. So now I've got her selfies and I've got her weight in pounds as the pounds column right here. And then I can click show charting options and I can say, you know what, I want a line chart showing the date of the tweet against her weight. And now I've got a weight of Cleo's, I've got Cleo's weight over time based on her selfies that she tweeted when she went to the vet. Obviously, this is a really powerful and useful application of technology. But to understand why I've been building this, um, we need to, I need to roll us back in time 17 years to um, 2003 um, uh, when I met this guy. This is Adrian Holovati, um, and Adrian Holovati was working at a newspaper in Kansas, and he posted a job opportunity on his blog. I saw this. I was at uh, university in England, but my university had a year in industry program where you could go and work for a company for a year and usually get a student visa for it. So I figured it would be kind of fun to head out to Kansas and spend a year working at this local newspaper. Kansas is a very small town. It's bang in the middle of America. And the newspaper was called the Lawrence Journal World. And Adrian and I got to use Python to build all sorts of really fun websites. Um, we built a local entertainment portal for the town of Lawrence, which had features like this page that lets you listen to MP3s of local bands that are performing in town this week. So it gives you a preview of concerts you could go to. Um, when the children's softball league happened, we built a, a website that went as far as having 360 degree photographs of all of the fields where these kids were going to play softball. This was in 2003, 2004. I think we used QuickTime VR for these. So we were building some really fun stuff. And the secret source for how we could build so many different interesting websites with just a small team was a web framework that we were building, which we called the CMS. But six months after I came home from Lawrence, and the newspaper open sourced as Django. And so Django came out in July 2005, and it's been, um, it's been continually growing ever since. But the idea behind Django was really about newspapers and how to productively build the kind of um, websites and applications that are needed in that news and journalism environment. A few years later, 2010, I found myself at the Guardian newspaper in London, where I got to work on some more sort of sophisticated, sophisticated data journalism projects, often using Django for those. Um, but one of the most interesting projects I worked on there was um, 
wasn't really code at all. It was a, it was a blog that we created where we realized that our journalists had been collecting all of this amazing data about the world, really detailed um, statistics, which we used for maps and infographics and visualizations that went out in the newspaper. Um, but we weren't doing anything with the data once the, once the newspaper had been published. So we decided to start publishing the data behind the stories. We created the data blog, and the idea was any time we put out a story with data in it, we try and publish the raw numbers as well. And we ended up using Google Sheets. So each story that was published with numbers would have an accompanying Google Sheet where people could get at the data and use it to potentially build their own visualizations and explore it on their own. I was always a little bit frustrated by this. I felt like there should be a better way to share data online than just copying and pasting it into a Google spreadsheet. But life took a different direction for me. Um, Natalie Down and I got married in 2010 and we went off on honeymoon traveling around the world and we accidentally started a company together. Uh, we started a startup on our honeymoon called Lanyard. It was a conference discovery website and we ended up raising money and hiring a team and running it for several years. And then three years after we launched it, we sold it to Eventbrite, the ticketing company. And we ended up moving ourselves and our team from England out to San Francisco to take on some very, very different challenges. So at Eventbrite, my focus was engineering at scale, figuring out how to build web applications that could handle millions of users and sell thousands of tickets in a very short space of time. And I learned a huge amount about building big, complex software with a really large team. But I didn't really get to think about journalism very much at all while I was doing this. And I was really missing that world, that world of um, journalism and telling stories through data. And then in 2017, I started thinking about serverless computing, this, this new model of computing that was becoming a, a, available. And anytime I look at a new technology, the question I ask myself is, what can I build now that I couldn't build before? Like, what new capabilities does this technology give me? So let's talk about serverless, um, serverless hosting providers. There's a bunch of things that make serverless interesting. There's this idea of scale to zero. If your, pro if your code isn't running, it doesn't cost you any money at all. Um, and it also means that if you don't get much traffic, your, the, the code execution is very cheap. So for somebody like me who loves building side projects, this is fantastic. I can have lots and lots and lots of funny little projects and they don't cost me any money. On the flip side, serverless lets you scale to infinity. If you get more traffic, they can spin up more servers and um, you should be able to handle as much traffic as the internet can throw at you. But this all comes at with one very important limitation. You can't save anything to disk with these serverless providers. If you're running on Heroku or Vercel or Google Cloud Run, anything you save to disk could disappear a few seconds later because saving things to disk doesn't fit this model of spinning up multiple copies of your code to handle varying amounts of traffic. And fundamentally, that means if you want a database, you're going to have to pay extra. You need to set up a database using some other service and pay, pay an additional amount to be able to read and write data from that database. And I started thinking, well, is there a way to cheat here? I, still, I was still, still thinking about that problem I had back at The Guardian where I just wanted to publish the data. I didn't need to change it. I thought, okay, so if the data never changes, do I need a separate database at all? Can I package that data up into a file and send that file up with the application code? So deploy my data and my code at the same time. It turns out the answer is yes. And that's mainly thanks to this fabulous piece of software called SQLite. Everyone here has used SQLite, probably uses SQLite every day, even if you don't realize it. Um, it's the world's most widely used database because it's designed to run on all sorts of devices. It runs on mobile phones. It runs on my watch. My, my step counter on my watch is keeping things in a SQLite database there. And it's so it's small, it's really fast, it's really reliable. It's an amazing database with just one limitation, which is that it's not particularly great at accepting large volumes of concurrent writes, the kind of thing that you'd get if you're running a really big website. But if you're publishing data, you don't need to accept any writes at all. You just need it for read-only data, which is something that it's fantastically well-suited for. 
And that's where my, I, the idea for Dataset came from. The idea was, OK, if I can bundle data up into a SQLite database and deploy it with an application that surrounds it and lets people browse it and interact with it through APIs, then I can take advantage of these serverless hosting providers and I can publish my data and my code in a way that costs me very little money and gives me a huge amount of flexibility. There's just one catch. If I'm going to do this, I need to be able to create these SQLite databases. I need to be able to get data from different places and put it in SQLite. So the other side of the dataset project is a bunch of tools I've been building to take data from different sources and bundle it up in one of these SQLite databases. I have a library I've built called SQLite Utils, which has Python um, functions, but also command line tools that you can use to interact with these. And I've been building various tools for converting other databases to SQLite, shapefiles to SQLite, Twitter data to SQLite, all sorts of bits and pieces like that. OK, let's build something fun with the with these tools. Uh, we're going to build a search engine for all of the trees in Buenos Aires. And the reason we can do that is that Buenos Aires has this website here. It's an open data portal. It's a website with 380 data sets provided by the city. And one of those is this CSV file of all of the trees in Buenos Aires. So I downloaded this earlier and it's pretty big. It's a 57 megabyte file, um, which looks like this. So it's classic comma separated data. It's got latitudes and longitudes and street addresses and all sorts of good stuff. So I'm going to use that SQLite utils command to insert that CSV file into a database table called trees in a trees.db database. I'm telling you it's a dash dash CSV file. And so this command is churning through all 370,000 rows in that CSV file. Um, it's creating a table with the right schema to import that data. And then it's copying each of those trees into that database table. And so once that's finished, we will have a file called trees.db that's a SQLite database. It's this one right here, which we can open up in dataset. So I'm going to say dataset trees.db dash O, which means open my browser. And here it is. This is our CSV file. So you can see it's got 370,000 rows in it. Uh, the latitude and longitude look like they might be interesting. It's got the nombre scientifico, so the scientific name for that species of tree, which is definitely something that we're going to want to play with. Now, I'm going to make a few changes to this um, file. Firstly, um, I'm going to rename these long and lat columns to be called longitude and latitude. And I can do that using the SQLite utils transform command. So I'm going to say I want to rename lat to latitude, and I want to rename long to longitude. Now, the reason I did that is Dataset, one of the plugins that I wrote for Dataset is a map plugin. And the way this works is it looks for latitude and longitude columns, and if it finds them, it uses them to draw that data on a map. So we're starting to see a map of all of these trees, which is, I think, pretty cool. Um, but I said we were going to build a search engine. so. What would a search engine for trees look like? Um, I'm going to search based on the street and the scientific name. So we've got a column here called Dirección Normalizada, which looks like it might be good for running a search against. And we've got this Nombre Científico co column as well. So I can type SQLite Utils, enable FTS. FTS is for full text search on trees.db. And I want to enable it on that trees column for that, uh, on the trees table for this column and this column here. So I'll paste these two in, run that command. And now if I open up Dataset again, you'll notice that the trees page has now grown a search box because we enabled search. So let's do a search for ficus, which is a common species of tree. Here we go. Here are 24,000 ficus trees in Buenos Aires. And you know what? I'm going to ask for a few more details. I'm going to go here and say facet by this so we can start seeing a count of the different types of ficuses. So we can see that the ficus elastica only has 550 trees. Let's click on that and just see those. So now I'm looking at a map of all 550 of these ficus elastica trees in Buenos Aires. And um, 
We can search by street as well. So if I search for this street name here, it'll show me the five on that street. You know, I'm gonna clear those out. Let's see everything, every search result for that street in the city. And unsurprisingly, those are all appearing in a line here on the map. So we've done it. We have built a search engine for the trees in Buenos Aires by downloading a CSV file, running a couple of commands, and then um, turning that into a data set. But there's one more step. I'm going to publish this to the internet. And the way I'm going to, I, the way I will do that is using the dataset publish command. So dataset publish um, lets you specify a hosting provider. Here I'm using Google Cloud Run. Give it a database, um, trees.db. I'm setting a title. I'm setting the service name that we used for the deployment. Um, I tried this earlier and it broke because Google Cloud Run defaults to giving you 256 megabytes of memory, which it turns out isn't enough for this database. So I'm jumping the memory up to one gigabyte. I'm installing that dataset cluster map plugin. And I've said, let's use the um, latest GitHub release of um, dataset as well. So I hit enter. And this command is now going to take my database and dataset and package them up into a Docker image, send that Docker image up to Google Cloud Run, which will then build that into a container. And it'll then wait for Google Cloud Run to deploy that container and assign it a URL. And this normally takes about a minute. So I'm going to speed the video up right now and, um, and jump straight to where it's, where it's deployed. Done. So if I click on this link here, here it is. This is my trees in Buenos Aires search engine. Um, I can click through here and start interacting with it. I can run a search for ficus. Um, and because this is a data set instance, I can export the data back out again. So if somebody really wants a CSV file of just those ficus trees, they can click CSV right here to get that data back out as CSV. There's a JSON API if somebody wants to build an interactive um, web application that consumes this data. We've, um, we've built something pretty sophisticated with very, very little effort here. Um, this is really the sort of, um, this is the goal for dataset is to make that is to make getting from I've got some data to that data is published online in a way that people can interact with it and build their own um, additional um, automations on top. It's to make that as, as quick and productive as possible. In order to get all of this working, I'm having to build a lot of software. I have over 400 repositories on GitHub now, um, but a more accurate count, if you look at my released projects, I've got 90 projects that I've made a release of to PyPy. Um, and this is a lot of software for me to keep track of and keep working on. And the way I've managed to do this is through lessons that I learned building much larger projects at Eventbrite. Um, I think there's something really interesting about what happens when you apply these large scale engineering techniques to much smaller projects where you've may maybe only got one or two developers working on them. So the things I learned at Eventbrite that were essential for building software that scale. Firstly, um, it was the importance of comprehensive unit tests. Being able to automatically prove that your software works makes it so much easier to make changes to it in the future because you can be confident that your changes are unlikely to break anything that, that, that's already working. Um, having continuous integration. So anytime you push code changes up to your Git repository, the test suite is run and any errors are identified straight away is a, is a really good way of enforcing that. Um, every change that I make to my projects is accompanied by a GitHub issue. Um, it might just be a single line describing what I'm doing, but the fact that there's an issue thread there gives me somewhere to put comments and add screenshots and link to documentation and generally means I've always got somewhere where I can collect the reasoning behind the code without necessarily having to put code comments in, my, in the files themselves. Um, every feature I build is documented. Um, this was a huge thing I had learned at Eventbrite where as your teams get bigger, if the code's not documented, you just can't trust people to be able to figure out how to use it or they might use it in ways that you weren't expecting. And the thing about documentation is it's a lot of work to get it up and running at first, but once it's there, changing it as you change the software is only a few lines of extra, um, extra typing to, to, up, to update the documentation covering the feature that you're working on. 
Um, at Eventbrite, we use microservices um, where the aim was to split up our products so we could ship new features without having to ship everything all at once. Datasets equivalent to that is the plugin system where I can build a new feature for dataset experimentally as a plugin and I don't have to release the core software in order to get that, um, that those features out there. And actually I found that that's liberating for me because it means if I've got an idea that's a little bit crazy, I can build it as a plugin and I know that I'm safe and I won't be causing damage to datasets core if the feature turns out not to have been a good idea. But really, the main reason that I'm applying all of these large-scale engineering practices is it means I don't have to remember anything about any of these projects that I'm working on myself. And when I've got 90 projects on the go at once, there's no way I'm going to remember those details. So by making sure they're tested and they're documented, I can drop in at any t to any project and essentially treat it like somebody else wrote the code. I can treat it like I've come in to fix a bug or to add a new feature to some project that's already been written by somebody else. The fact that that somebody else was me just a few weeks ago doesn't really, um, doesn't really come into play. So when I started doing this, I thought that applying these large scale, these big team approaches to personal projects would slow me down. It's actually had the opposite effect. It's sped me up because I can work on so many more projects at the same time and switch between them without any of that overhead of trying to figure out what I was doing and, um, and, and how the thing that I'm, uh, how, how this thing works at the moment. But that's enough about engineering. Let's get back to selfies of my dog. The last thing I want to talk about is my dog sheep project. So you've seen a little bit of dog sheep before when, we, um, when I showed you the, the graphs of, uh, of, of my dog Cleo's weight. But what dog sheep is, is my take on the idea of personal analytics. The idea is for me to pull in data about myself from as many sources as possible, get it all in one place in one private data set instance so I can start running queries and um, tying it together and, and trying to learn more about my own life. And so this is my personal dog sheep. I have data from a ton of different places. I have Twitter data, health kit data from my Apple Watch, stuff I've done on GitHub, my Foursquare Swarm check-ins, every photograph I've taken. I've got a copy of my genome, my pocket save things, my Evernote notes, Goodreads, all of this different stuff. And I think it's worth explaining why I call this thing dog sheep. Um, so, the inspiration for this was this guy called Stephen Wolfram. Um, you may have heard of him. He's responsible for Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha, and a whole bunch of, um, of scientific and mathematical software. And Stephen Wolfram last year published this incredible essay called Seeking the Productive Life, Some Details of My Personal Infrastructure. And this is an essay about how he gets stuff done. And the main thing to know about this essay is if you look at this scroll bar, this is long. He goes into every detail of 30 years of processes he's put in place to make himself as productive as possible. And a lot of this stuff is completely crazy. He has a standing desk to make sure that he gets the right amount of exercise according to his heart monitor. Um, only he found that he, his heart does better if he goes outside, so he built himself a laptop rig for walking in the woods. He's, um, he built himself a green screen set up in his basement so that he can give talks from home. Um, he's got maps of everywhere he's ever been. He's scanned every document that he's ever written. Huge, it's just a huge amount of effort he's put into his personal productivity. And I read through this and most of this seemed pretty nuts to me. But there was one thing in here that I really liked where he talks about how he has a thing he calls a meta searcher. It's a personal search engine where he can type, he, it runs just for him, he can run a search and he gets back every email he's sent or received for 30 years, every file on any of his machines, every paper document that he scanned, all of this different stuff, and it's all in one place. And I read this and I thought, you know, I really want that. I love the idea of a sort of personal search engine. So I decided to build it. But of course, I needed a name for it. Now, it's inspired by Stephen Wolfram, and I'm actually, this is, I'm going to switch into Spanish a little bit to talk about this. So 
Stephen Wolf Ram, that's Wolf Ram, which in Spanish is Lobo Canero. And I thought, well, pero mi versión no es tan poderosa as that. I, I'm building something less impressive. So instead of Wolf Ram, Lobo Canero, I went with Pero Oveja, which in English is Dog Sheep. And so the name Dog Sheep comes from the fact that I'm inspired by Stephen Wolf Ram, but the thing I'm building is not really as, um, as impressive as the thing that he made. And I liked that joke so much that I committed to building the software. So I'll show you a few of the other tricks that I can do in this. Um, you saw uh, Cleo's weight, um, but I also have my swarm check-ins. So I can, um, so every time I check in using swarm, I get that in my database and I can see, okay, I checked in at North Lake and the archery range and so forth. And anytime I check in with Cleo, I use the wolf emoji in my check-in message, which means I can run this SQL query here, which looks for check-ins where the wolf emote, where a shout is like wolf emoji, and I can plot those on a map. And now I get a map of everywhere that Cleo likes to go. So this is Cleo's personal map based on a SQL query with a wolf emoji in it. And I, I love that that's something that you can do these days. Um, I, I mentioned that I've got a copy of my genome, which is great because it means I can tell you what color my eyes are using SQL. Here's a SQL query that says that my eyes are blue 99% of the time because I've got a GG genotype in this particular um, position on my, on, 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 on my genetic structure. Um, I use the Apple Watch and it turns out the Apple Watch gathers an enormous quantity of data about myself. Um, so I've got things like my, re my heart rate over time, the number of steps I've taken, I've got um, my walking speed, here we go. I've got how much energy I've burned, my blood pressure, all of this different stuff. But the most fun thing about that is anytime you track a workout on the Apple Watch, when you say, I'm going for a run, it records your location every few seconds, which means you can, um, which means you can pull up a workout and see it on a map. So I ran the half marathon in San Francisco a few years ago. This is my full route, tracks every few seconds when I ran the marathon in San Francisco. And that was just sat there on my watch waiting for me to export that data out and convert it into a format where I could start visualizing it and exploring it. I've got all of my photographs in here. So I use Apple Photos on my phone and Apple Photos synchronizes to my laptop um, but it also runs a machine learning model on my device. So it runs it on my phone to try and figure out what's in my photographs. And that means that if I search for a pelican, for example, I can get back all of the photos that I've taken of pelicans according to the Apple Photos, um, according to the Apple Photos algorithm. So here are my pelican photos. It does a pretty great job. And then when I was digging around in the Apple Photos database, I noticed that it has scores. It has this thing called a overall aesthetic score and it's got a um, harmonious color score and a lively color score and all of a pleasant camera tilt score. And so I can sort by those. So I've sorted by that aesthetic score, which means that this is the best photograph I've taken of a pelican according to Apple Photos algorithms, which is pretty cool. You know, it's really fun that we can dig into the data that they've been building about our photographs and reuse it for our own purposes. Um, I mentioned uh, Twitter earlier, so I can show you tweets by my dog. I can also search tweets that I've favorited. So I've got 25,000 tweets that I've favorited. And if I search for say PyCon, it'll show me just the tweets that mention PyCon, which I've added to my favorites. I've got my GitHub data in here. So I can show you things like a graph of how many commits I've made on a daily basis over time to those projects. But the thing I really wanted to do with all of this was I wanted to build that search engine. Um, I wanted to t try and find a way to tie all of my data together. And a couple of months ago, I finally built it. This is my search engine. It's called Dog Sheep Beta. 
because Stephen Wolfram has a search engine called Wolfram Alpha, and I figured that the obvious name for my search engine then would be, would be Dog Sheep Beta. And Dog Sheep Beta lets me search my own stuff. Um, so I'm gonna search for Buenos Aires as an example. And when I do that, it pulls back data from my tweets and my photos and my check-ins and my blog entries show up on here. So having searched for Buenos Aires, I've got a blog entry about it. And then I've got photographs I took in Buenos Aires. Um, I've got swarm check-ins, I've got tweets. I can say, you know, just show me the check-ins and it'll show me places that I've checked in that match that search term. And I can see down the side that I clearly did the most stuff in Buenos Aires in May of 2018. And that's 127 items, um, most of those are photographs. But I've got this ability to, to search across all of my different stuff. All of this software, everything in Dog Sheep is open source. So if you want to try it out yourself, uh, you can go to github.com slash dog sheep and start pulling these things together. There's quite a lot of assembly required, unfortunately, because you need to install the different tools, set up crons to or that, that are authenticated to pull in your data and get it running securely somewhere so that you can, you can control who can access it. But um, it's all available for you to try it if you want to. And really what I'm trying to do here, um, I, people have asked me what my overall goals with, with data set and with all of these tools are. And my favorite um, comparison is to look at WordPress. So WordPress is a blogging engine um, but it grew, grew this incredible ecosystem of plugins, thousands and thousands of WordPress plugins, which means that it can take on basically any web publishing problem that you can think of. Um, all of web publishing can be solved using WordPress. So my goal with Dataset is to say, okay, if you've got Dataset and all of these different plugins, together you can solve any problem that you might want to with, with sharing data online and making data um, explorable and accessible to people. And I think that's really exciting. Um, it's all open source. If you're interested in, um, get, if you want to get involved with the project, um, you can head to github.com slash simonw slash dataset and take a look. You can, we have a discussion forum there that you're welcome to join. And I'll be hanging around during uh, PyCon Argentina, um, ready to answer questions and talk to people who want to learn more about this project. So, Thank you so much for um, for your time, and um, and I've really enjoyed I've really enjoyed being invited to this conference. Hopefully, someday in the future, we'll get to do this um, in person. Um, but until then, uh, it's been great talking to you. And please add your questions to the Google Doc, and um, feel free to talk to me during the conference as well. Thanks a lot.